Street racing enthusiasts and car tuners are notorious for their relentless pursuit of speed. Every millisecond saved, every ounce of horsepower unleashed, matters. Interestingly, this obsession finds an unlikely historical parallel in the desperate struggle of World War II German engineers. What I'm saying is your friend with the Honda Civic, which always smells suspiciously of motor oil, shares more in common with German aerospace engineers than you might imagine. If you consider street racing as a fierce national sprint for speed, World War II, by contrast, was a grueling Olympic marathon. Today, a poorly executed engine tweak might cost a few crucial seconds in a race. Back in the tumultuous 1940s, though, a minor variation in velocity could spell the difference between a triumphant return home or a tragic demise. In the throes of this high-stakes race, Germany found itself in a perilous predicament. Firstly, as the war ground on, the scarcity of premium metals left them scrambling. This caused them to use economy steel in their engine components, which were prone to knocking. As a result, their engines simply couldn't withstand the heat that Allied engines could. So, despite their hard work, their attempts to keep up with the engineering prowess of the Allied forces led to the creation of increasingly underwhelming aircraft engines, inefficient, prone to overheating, and downright dangerous. In fact, for several years of the conflict, the DB series of engines had to be downrated to avoid catastrophic engine failure. Secondly, Germany grappled with a frustrating fuel issue. While the Allies were essentially dry-scooping pre-workout with their 150-octane fuel by the war's end, the Germans found that the majority of their aviation fuel was something closer to a LaCroix, less a powerful punch and more a disappointing fizz. So what's a frustrated German engineer to do? Well, they turned to some outside-the-box thinking. They needed a shortcut, a cheat code, a life hack to squeeze out every last drop of horsepower from their underachieving engines. Thus, the grand experiment began. Scientists in lab coats with German accents began pouring stuff into their engines, a bit like your buddy who swears his old beat-up car runs better on premium gas. The first attempts involved spraying liquid oxygen into the engines to beef up their high-altitude performance. But liquid oxygen proved to be a little like that kid in class who knows all the answers, but can't stop blowing stuff up in the chemistry lab. It was just too hot to handle. Next on the list was nitrous oxide, also known as Mona gas or Goring Mixture 1. And naming it after Goring was a bit of brown nosing, as he had as much to do with the development as I do with the theory of relativity, but hey, you gotta do what you gotta do. Now, this stuff was like the Goldilocks of engine boosters. When it broke down in the combustion chamber, it did two pretty amazing things. First, it cooled down the cylinder, easing those pesky detonation issues, and second, it split into nitrogen and oxygen, adding more of the good stuff for combustion, hence more power. Now, this was a promising find, but German engines were already straining under their mechanical limits at sea level, so using nitrous oxide for power boost there would have caused more harm than good. With that in mind, they stuck to using it for high altitude performance, like a secret turbo button. Meanwhile, across the pond, the Brits were starting to wonder if the Germans had found some magical go faster button. They decided they needed a piece of this action and began their own scientific treasure hunt. They tested everything from methanol to water, liquid oxygen, and even liquid ammonia. But because their engines were still using carburetors, while the Germans had leveled up to direct fuel injection, they faced some unique challenges. They found that injecting a second liquid into the cylinder meant installing a whole new injection system. Plus, shooting water into the supercharger didn't work unless it was done with high enough pressure to atomize it properly. Fast forward to 1943, and a downed Ju-88 bomber was captured and examined by British engineers. What they found blew their minds. The Germans were using laughing gas in their engines, which made way more sense why captured German pilots were told to call this system the Haha process. Funny it took British intelligence over a year to figure out that the Haha process was nitrous oxide injection. With their newfound discovery in 1944, the Brits finally got their nitrous oxide systems flying in mosquitoes, giving them an edge in speed. But just as they thought they'd cracked all of Germany's secrets, they discovered a methanol injection system from a captured BF-109G. It was a dual system that could be used alongside the nitro system. Turns out, the methanol could cool the cylinder charge by a whopping 40 degrees Celsius, leading to an impressive power boost of 470 horsepower at sea level. Interestingly, the Brits had actually done some research into injecting methanol back in 1941, but hadn't seen a need to develop it further, probably due to their already superior fuel quality and strategic alloys, which allowed them to push their engines to higher boost pressures without fuel additives. With that said, if we've learned anything so far, it's that where Germany and Britain went, America was sure to follow. And unsurprisingly, over in the States, America was busy spraying too. 
Over in the States, they had stumbled upon the merits of methanol water mixture, similar to the Germans concoction, and named it anti-detonant injection. They started using it in their Pratt & Whitney R2800 engines to supercharge their performance, which resulted in a whopping 2,800 horsepower. And that was important. That amount of horsepower finally gave the P-47s in the European theater enough power to keep up with the high-altitude Focke-Wulfs that they kept encountering. Now, with the success of ADI, you'd think that Britain would jump on this bandwagon too. However, British aviation technology seemed stubbornly tied to carburetors, and water injection, while possible, was problematic with them. And, with the war entering its final throes, the urgency to refine this technology simply waned. Fast forward to the post-war era, this secret world of engine boosters and horsepower enhancers seemed to fade into oblivion, with the world now focused on the nuclear age. However, there was one group that was keenly interested in what those World War II engineers had been up to, hot rod racers. At the time, post-war America was experiencing a huge boom in the automobile industry, with soldiers returning home and wanting a slice of American life, which of course, included cars. Hot rod racing was beginning to gain popularity, and these guys were all about pushing their engines to the limit for maximum speed. In their quest for speed, they soon discovered what the World War II engineers had known, the magical speed-enhancing properties of nitrous oxide. The hot rod community soon began to experiment with nitrous, or NOS as it became known. They found that by injecting nitrous oxide into the engine, they could drastically increase their car speed, turning ordinary vehicles into road-ripping beasts. NOS's adoption in the hot rod community wasn't without its challenges, though. Just like in the Second World War, there was a significant learning curve in figuring out how to safely and effectively use the gas. Too much NOS, and you could blow your engine to smithereens. But with time and practice, the hot rod racers mastered the art of the NOS boost. Over time, the use of nitrous oxide in cars became so prevalent that it was virtually synonymous with street racing. This made it a natural fit for Hollywood's portrayal of the world of high-speed racing, most notably in the Fast and Furious franchise. In a twist of fate, the Fast and Furious films led to a renewed interest in the historical roots of nitrous oxide use in engines. Car enthusiasts started digging into history books, unearthing the fascinating story of NOS that started with desperate German engineers in World War II. And so, the story of nitrous oxide's journey from the World War II skies to the streets of today has come full circle. It's a tale of human ingenuity and the relentless pursuit of speed, a pursuit that continues to drive us quite literally into the future.